Prairie Monk WAFT Champagne, 90.1 on your FM dial. And Dave on the board. This is Sunday, 8th. December the 8th, 2019, and this is the Prairie Monk Program, WEFT's weekly look at rails, trails, greenways, which are still passable right now. This would be a great time to go up riding because the temperatures are nicely in the 40s. Maybe wear a jacket, but you probably won't need like a winter coat because it's getting kind of warm out there. Well, warm for bicycling. Um, And um, conservation and everything else that Dave has been up to for the last week. Dave, what have you been up to for the last week? So, first of all, in passing, uh, uh, Justice Jane, uh, Harold Jensen passed recently, and uh, his memorial service was yesterday. And uh, he, he was not only a justice, but he was on the school board, he was on the uh, library board, he had a lot to do with the... He was chair of the uh, replacement of the uh, uh, clock tower on... The, on the county buildings, and uh, he grew up in first in Chicago and then in Champaign, and married in Champaign. Had his children here. Was in the Navy, and uh, came back, got a law degree, and worked with the Hatch people uh, as a, a combined legal group and uh, so a very deserving character who was a circuit judge and uh, was presided over a lot of things. Uh, we remember Harold, he was a big man and filled quite a few shoes including uh, adjunct teaching at the law school. Um, but uh, we also remember uh, Maddie Frankel. Uh, I knew her husband indirectly by working with scientists, and he was a biologist. But uh, we often f- forget that in a past era, Women fulfilled a a home role that uh, often denied their academic achievements, and so she was a an immigrant. Her family came here in the late twenties. Uh, were in Brooklyn for a while, and then went to Berkeley, and she graduated from there. Married. Marvin Frankel came here, and she too was a, a researcher with the university, and uh, uh, we remember people who uh, are actively engaged in the background. These days, women are getting more opportunity to not only have family, but to come back into the uh, academic community or other communities, uh, depending on what they want to do in life, and they get a little bit more chance to be themselves, and and you don't have to be an academic. But uh, both sexes have a chance to do things. Uh, Today I want to uh, continue uh, with uh, some thoughts about connectivity. We, we were looking at uh, the uh, short line prairie in between Gifford and Penfield and uh, looking at the pieces of land around, whether it be a uh, hunting club or, uh, or a set aside or a uh, Various different interests. How uh, do you uh, 
suggest uh, these sorts of relationships and how do you introduce local people to that because they don't necessarily always understand their heritage and also to visit <coughs> tourists that not only come with interest but they also provide an economic base for uh, looking at other communities whether they be countries or their own backyard. I want to take you to Shady Rest which is about <coughs> 20 miles west of Champagne and uh, I want you to look at the connectivity around that site, what was the history and uh, so Shady Rest <coughs> is a 30 acre plot of land on the banks of the Sangamon but it also backs up onto the Saragorda Moraine. So it, it has quite a few different habitats from very wet to very dry. There's a <coughs> railroad that goes through it uh, that uh, cuts the 30 acres in, in, in part, but uh, that railroad goes through to Clinton and uh, the site is, has a historic base of being a recreational site where you could uh, get to it with a horse and cart and uh, it uh, lost its <coughs> immediacy when uh, transportation got to be different and you could go further afield and uh, so it became a retreat for a paint company and uh, it was platted uh, but never developed except for one or two buildings. So let's go back to this general area. You, you on the river and an early settlement was by the river and so there was a uh, area called Musgrave which was about a mile north of the present Monticello. Uh, it was on the river. The river was running through a flatland, so in order to have a mill that was run by water, you had to have a, a very long race that gave you enough fall to be able to operate a water wheel. Uh, uh, this, the uh, grinding stones there for grinding grain uh, are still there at Musgrave and uh, the town of Monticello went uh, further south and you, you don't exactly know why uh, we're encouraged to uh, try and put information together it may not be always correct but uh, I suspect that Monticello was established because the Pyatt family had land there and that was the early settlement. Uh, it was often the case, it's the same case with Urbana. Uh, land was donated for a village or a town. Uh, I want to go back to that early history again. Uh, later came the railroads and uh, the railroads in themselves are a history. If you look at these railroads wanting to go across the country there was competition in a race for those who got there first and you know, would be able to join with railroads coming from the west. Uh, so this line that Shady Rest is on uh, was uh, early, uh, almost a straight line from Danville through Champaign, uh, through Whiteheath to Clinton and on to Lincoln. Uh, there was, however, about 15 miles from Champaign, a situation where 
you had to cross the Sangamon River. Uh, for engineers, that was quite a challenge. Uh, and the, just east of uh, Whiteheath, the railroad took a move to, this, to the west and then later came back onto that uh, straight line. Uh, the reason for doing that was that uh, railroads often find it convenient to follow a uh, glaciated river down and across the glacial meltway, which in this case was the Sangamon River. Uh, that uh, creek becomes a river and it erodes the land so that a railroad can follow that valley down and cross the river without having to do a lot of uh, excavation. Uh, so often a railroad will be diverted some to go across the stream where there is that sort of facility. You also look on the other side to see that there's a stream that, that you could go up and uh, in this case not quite so essential because uh, the, the area to the west of Whiteheath tends to be rather flat and outwash plain. Uh, so there's history there that belongs to the railroad. Uh, we have a Champagne Havana and Western Historic Railroad formed and we're hoping to uh, reconstruct that railroad bed uh, and, and uh, that relates to other parts of that same line uh, where there is a historic railroad museum that's been doing very well. The line we're talking about uh, at, well, before it closed out which was probably 30 years ago, uh, went from Champagne to White Heath, which was at the nub of that uh, invagination that I talked about, uh, where the, the railroad went west to cross the river. Uh, the White Heath is on a raised area, which was uh, a moraine, and it was the hilly area that provided the stream which in glaciated time would be taking melt water out but in when the world, world warmed up then <coughs> that water was a regular stream and you would have to put in a bridge or two in order to uh, cross this little stream but that was much less engineering than to have a straight line and have to create a, um, a, a cutting down to the river and up from the river. Uh, the, at White Heath there was, uh, the, the railroad went from Champagne, Bonville, Seymour, White Heath, and then it went to to Monticello at this stage when railroads were coming in in the 1850s. Monticello was established. It was also on the river. Uh, so uh, probably some of the earlier settlement in Monticello as well as at Musgrave was probably from the river. Uh, that railroad went down and then moved southwest to Cisco, uh, Argenda, and into Decatur. Uh, there were many railroads. This was the transportation of the day. It was more f efficient than uh, trying to bring uh, paddle wheelers up the rivers and then having to uh, get into flat-bottom boats or canoes and go 
follow the streams, probably uh, mostly when there was a, a fresh or a flooding of the stream so that you wouldn't have to deal with all the uh, snags and uh, challenges in a stream. So railroads were more efficient and canals were there. Canals can go by um, locks and dams up and over a ridge and then come down on the other side. But the canals barely got established before the railroads came in. And then the railroads uh, brought most of our settlers to this community. Uh, and there were north-south lines as well as east-west lines. And there was also an interurban. By the time you got to 1900, uh, there was electricity and you could have electric trains running from the, these various communities. They were lightweight rail, lightweight uh, equipment, and the sort of thing that's where you could put up your hand and, and the interurban would stop for you and uh, you could go from community to community. This was very different from having a, a, a mainline railroad. But uh, the railroads were interested in uh, servicing the small communities about five miles apart each, and uh, north, south, east, and west. If you're in a plane, you, you couldn't do it at the time because there, there weren't that, those sorts of planes. Uh, you would imagine uh, looking at a profile of the uh, landscape and you'd see these railroads running north, south, east, west and sometimes at a diagonal. Uh, so th the line at White Heath was a junction and uh, the, the rail was uh, put into the west to go to Deland, Weldon, Lane, Clinton, and on to Lincoln and, and further. It would uh, have difficulties getting across the Illinois River and the Mississippi. So there was a, a delay at that end. Usually most all of the railroads that were going west were having the same problem. They would ship rail cars across uh, to the other side and, and that was effective but not as effective as a bridge in the long run bridges were established all across those major rivers. Uh, so at Whiteheath we have a, a, a village uh, established on a moraine. It's quite high, it's Cerro Gordo moraine and, and then there's a, the railroad goes down to Shady Rest, across Shady Rest uh, and up to Lodge. But there were connections you could connect uh, to a north-south line, and uh, which would head towards Chicago. And uh, at Monticello, there was a, uh, also a <coughs> uh, connection. And these days, the, the, the seven miles of that line was captured by the Monticello Railroad Museum as a uh, site for uh, a historic train. They had already been there and had bought a portion of the interurban, which came Champagne, Monticello, Piment, and across to Decatur. A slightly different route than the uh, main line. The, uh, so if we're looking at contiguity, we have a railroad museum with seven miles of land. You have four miles of uh, Heartland Pathways territory, which the Champaign Havana and Western Railroad is restoring to uh, trackage so that we can get uh, historic trains into Champaign. Then if you go to the other end of the seven miles of Monticello Railroad Museum, you have the township of or the city of Monticello, and the rail continues through to 
past Allerton Park uh, to Cisco uh, Agenda, Oriana, and Decatur. Uh, just just following that history is is interesting. Uh, there's a Y at either end of the uh, Monticello Railroad Museum's main line. Uh, the the interurban that they had already bought uh, is back up for equipment and materials when uh, people like ADM want to store vehicles, they can store them on the interurban, which basically was adjacent to the main line. And the roads came in, and they were adjacent to the main line too. Quick question for you. <clears throat> My understanding is, you've said this before, the interurban tracks didn't have to be as sturdy. They, could, they were going to carry lighter loads. So, But you just said that the, the large cars from the major line can actually park their cars on that lighter yes, track? Yes. The, the, the rails come uh, in, in various uh, weights, and they're usually it's a, a, a yard of rail. If you're on the main line, like what goes through Champaign at the moment, a hundred and thirty-five pound for a yard. If you have sidelines like uh, areas where you can st store vehicles, the the weight goes down. Uh, and if you're on a uh, interurban, uh, you can get away with having a, a, a rail that is uh, more like 60, uh, 69 pounds per yard, and that means it's light. But if you have empty cars, uh, that the, the uh, ADM can store cars there. You can also have filled cars. In some cases where uh, the interurban was uh, in a different location than the main line, uh, you could even bring out grain on the interurban. Uh, it, it's strong enough. Uh, the the uh, grade was also not as uh, well formed. It, uh, a mainline grade, you would have gravel of various de descriptions, and you would have the areas well drained and uh, substantial. Uh, the interurban came in when, with electricity in the early 19, 1905, that sort of time. And yes, they were used locally. You could travel through most of the state on an interurban, but you would have to take days doing it because everyone would be using it to go a few miles and, and drop off. And very different from the main line, which you would leave Champaign and be headed for Decatur and probably stop at Decatur and, and uh, uh, be an express train. So if you wanted to get from Champaign to St. Louis in a day, you would take the uh, main line. If it was an overnight thing, you wanted to go to California or somewhere like that, you would have sleeping cars and uh, that train would stop occasionally, but not for very long. And the speed would be much greater than the uh, interurban, which is more or less like a little tram. Mm -hmm. You would have round the various cities like Champaign, you would have tram tracks and right at the end of a street where Weft is, there's a building where those tram tracks would uh, come in and, and, and tram uh, vehicles, usually one or two linked together. Uh, would do with local transportation. Uh, so the uh, quality of the line would vary a little if you were going to do interurban between uh, Champaign and St. Joe, the, the line would probably be a little heavier. Uh, and, and that continued till 1950s. 19, I think the last interurban uh, going out of Champaign was in ni 1956. Uh, the, the, by that time, uh, people had gotten to be uh, 
used to uh, vehicles. Uh, many of the men folk had been to uh, World War I and had been driving tanks and uh, flying planes and things and uh, the interurban was uh, not as convenient. So the roads got developed and then in, in the 50s, uh, interstate uh, roads were developed. Uh, but the, the uh, going back to the conti continuity uh, situation, uh, White Heath and Monticello and Champagne and Clinton, uh, they become uh, uh, an interesting place for ourselves and visitors to understand the, the landscape of each East Central Illinois. Uh, as with most other landscape we're talking about, uh, including Giffen, uh, uh, moraines are involved, so they're a little higher and, and uh, often provide a, a more stable situation than if you're on the bottomlands or floodplains, which were uh, well drained in a way, but they could also be flooded. And uh, so you, you're looking at a, a region uh, that has character. And how do we bring it together and how do we bring you together to view it? And uh, that's sort of what I'm at, is to, to let you know that this area is interesting and intriguing. Uh, we may not have all the historic answers because uh, the uh, communities involved in settlement were too uh, busy engaged in, in uh, creating their uh, agriculture and uh, settling that that most of this information is verbal. And so you have uh, genealogy and uh, history organizations that uh, research this, but we're encouraged by groups like the Urbana Free Library uh, to try and gather up the verbal stories and put them together, even though they might not be accurate they can always be modified. Uh, we hope that we don't give misinformation, but basically, uh, if you're a responsible historian, you try to, to give the idea without necessarily making a mistake about what it might have been. So we are inviting you as citizens to contribute your histories and they're mostly verbal. So you need to find your families and f find that the information that you have stored in the, the basement or the attic, which is not the right place for the storage of this sort of a material. But uh, many times people have stumbled over uh, stored materials that uh, give rise to history. It, it also involves natural areas because sometimes the natural area that has been preserved by a, a settler family uh, uh, sits there and uh, it could be interpreted, uh, could be managed, uh, and could be cared for uh, by organizations like Grand Prairie Friends and, and Prairie Rivers and others that do this sort of thing. Uh, there are societies like Audubon and Isaac Walton League and Sierra Club that all involved in this sort of thing. It's a, it's a, a, a joint process, and various groups have different uh, objectives. But bringing it together, uh, it makes for a family of men, um, men including men and women, and uh, so uh, we're looking at these sites around Monticello. It includes Allerton Park, which is thousands of acres of uh, open space uh, put there by Sam Allerton, who was uh, working in the uh, Civil War and providing food for uh, Union armies. 
And so he managed to gather up uh, enough uh, economics to be able to buy land in various places. Uh, and one of those places is Allerton Park, which he gave to his son, uh, Robert, and it's adjacent to this railroad line. And uh, so next, just up the road a little bit, there's a large park where another uh, set aside was uh, donated to, uh, in this case, I think it's the Forest Preserve uh, of Pyatt County. Uh, whatever, it, it's preserved. And it's Shady Rest, uh, just behind, to the west of uh, White Heath. Shady Rest is also one of these sorts of places where uh, there was a, 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 an attempt to put in a uh, plat so that uh, 30 or 40 houses could be put in that location. It didn't really happen because Monticello happened, yeah. uh, but uh, th there is still that plat. There's, uh, and, and there was also the fact that it was a place for recreation. It was uh, near enough to Champaign, Decatur, uh, and Clinton to, that people could go there on, and fish in the Sangman River or uh, meet with each other and uh, uh, Shady Rest until the last few years was a, a row of uh, uh, small huts that you could rent and uh, some administrative buildings and uh, the Price family that uh, owned a, a DuPont, DuPont paint store uh, bought the area as a retreat <laughs> after it was figured that people could go further to other sites. So, uh, and eventually that has found its way into the Pyatt County Forest Preserve and is preserved uh, in perpetuity. Uh, so, uh, you have a, a, a nice site which has a little the creek coming through it. It has the railroad. It has a truss bridge. Uh, it, it meanders in a natural ma manner. It's not channelized. Uh, there are flatlands to the north uh, near Centerville, uh, which could have been the, uh, the straight line between Champaign and Clinton. Uh, wasn't, and it was also platted uh, and partially developed. But there are huge flatlands there that flood easily and are not good for agriculture. But they could be good for bicycle tracks and, and uh, uh, other activities that would be seasonal. Uh, like in summertime, it's dry, and you can use those corridors. Uh, this is dreaming and uh, the trying to make a connection between the Monticello Railroad Museum and Champagne is a dream. Uh, uh, thinking about bicycle ways is another dream. Uh, thinking about where to put a historic museum which used to be downtown Monticello but now is near to the railroad uh, station and the depot. Uh, Nelson's Crossing. Uh, then, then uh, you're looking how to put this together so you you have a family situation. I just was talking to to uh, Patsy Petrie, and uh, she was saying that she was in Belgium, and and some of these various different groups uh, tend to, to get together and, and uh, find each other's company. And uh, that, that is what you find in a community like Monticello. You find a school district that's uh, viable. You uh, put in a 30-acre sports arena 
for getting uh, people together from various communities to have a, 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 a ball games that are exciting. Uh, so how do you join this sort of complex uh, with uh, uh, in about 35 years ago, uh, the railroad was being taken out, and looking at this overall situation, uh, Heartland Pathways, uh, with various community help, uh, bought uh, 33 miles of that railroad bed, and with the intent, first of all, to preserve the heritage vegetation, which is prairie. And prairie doesn't have very many uh, advocates. So uh, that was number one issue. The number two issue was uh, possible re-railing if uh, you wanted to, to continue some of that railroad effort. And number three was to put in trails. Hopefully the trails that are not so wide that they take out the, the uh, prairie. Uh, so those dreams have gradually uh, come to fruition, not totally. Uh, we did that long before there was a rail banking act which uh, was uh, designed along the same lines, it was to save corridors uh, that could not be replaced in the future. So uh, the d federal government decided to put money into that so that they would have the possibility of coming in with railroad in the future. You would not, n not always know what sort of railroad, but the corridor would be there. So uh, that's what we have contributed to. And then later, uh, money from the federal government assured that that would uh, be there. Every time you save that thin r r line of railroad, you're saving some of the heritage prairie. And if you go through a bottomland forest, like at Shady Rest, you're saving forest. You're saving understory forest herbs, and, and, and Shady Rest is alive with, with plants. Uh, Dutchman's breeches, squirrel corn, uh, uh, Jack in the pulpit, uh, just a, a whole range of, of wildlife that's there in uh, a small area. Uh, so Shady Rest has had the advantage of people looking at it and it was eventually uh, designated as a soil and water conservation easement <coughs> which preserves the dignity of the, uh, the the plants that are there and and preserves the dignity of the sociology of having a recreational site and and also of having a feature of a, a truss bridge and there aren't a lot of truss bridges left because uh, the, the, there is money in the salvage of uh, uh, the steel that's in the truss bridge, so once the railroad closes out, the bridges are taken out. They're also taken out for safety in case somebody wants to j jump off a bridge and hurt themselves. Uh, so we have, on that 33 miles, 27 trestles and three major truss bridges. At Monticello, Monticello City, with uh, perspicacity, has... Uh, uh, acquired a, an easement on our line that goes from west of Monticello across the Sangamon River. So uh, a, a two-mile Sangamon River trail has been established, which is parallel to the road that comes in from the expressway or the old highway, which is old 47. Uh, the, the traffic on Bridge Road there is fairly heavy and there's not a lot of width for uh, bikers and hikers to use that corridor. But conveniently, uh, next, just parallel, uh, 
Actually, the road paralleled the railroad. The railroad was there for us. Um, Monticello City has established a two mile of very nice, not too wide uh, trail, which goes over the uh, Sangamon River on Trust Bridge, so you can stop there and uh, look at the Sangamon in its various levels. If it's flood time, you can see it merging into the floodplain. There are historic <coughs> levees there. Um, people found that they could put a levee on the banks of the Sangamon and then uh, pump the water out from behind so that you would have a bottomland almost a little lower than the, the stream, but you could plow it. At least those, those little blocks are uh, fairly small and not suitable for f big farm equipment. So uh, if you stand on the truss bridge at, uh, uh, on the Sangamon, you can look at the levee, the historic levee that was used for agriculture. Yeah. So you try to bring these things together. Uh, Monticello uh, had a doctor, Dr. Caldwell, who people revered. He'd given he'd birthed uh, most all of the families there, and he uh, was in an era in the, about the 1900s when uh, pepsin was discovered, and pepsin uh, was in Seneca leaves that uh, various leaves you could extract pepsin from. So Dr. Cole had a, a storefront on uh, the Monticello Square, and uh, uh, it gradually got pop, uh, popular. So these days, Pepsi Bismol is the same uh, breed of chemical, and it's still very much uh, alive. But in the uh, in the late eighties and and early nineties. The pepsin uh, product was uh, welcome because uh, whether you had diarrhea or you had constipation, it settled your stomach and, and uh, did it in a manner that other agencies like mustard and uh, were, were not very friendly. So gradually that evolved into a uh, an industry, yeah. into a first of all a a pirate family house, and then into a pepsin factory that was five stories on one side and three stories on the other because there's a little hill there, and and uh, it surrounded the house so that uh, the e, e, the center leg of the E was uh, the pirate uh, house and the laboratories and uh, developmental areas uh, were the other two E's and the shoulder of the E. Uh, and this was located where there was a Y, and the Y being a, a place where you could turn a train around. It's a, it's a triangle, so you can uh, also join up with the railroad that came through from the north-south. Uh, so there was a Pepsin factory that was in a location that was typical of uh, people uh, discovering something, doing something about it, and it was, uh, uh, and, and still is, an indication of uh, economic development uh, f through from when the product or whatever it was that was exciting uh, to be developed in a small community. Uh, the Pepsin factory eventually had the uh, best part of 250, 300 employees, and the product was being shipped out around the world, so the railroad lines were key. Uh, the, uh, unfortunately, uh, from my point of view, uh, and a lot of others, it was a factory that was run down some, it needed uh, uh, 
fifty thousand dollars for roofing. It, uh, but it was a strong building. It, it had character. There were attempts to put business into it in the ground floor. But this is the sort of uh, gray field that faces America in many places. Uh, there are often factories that uh, could produce a product, but it could be produced in another country with less cost for labor, and uh, so these factories closed. Uh, but there is a variable use of these places. Uh, uh, th there's a <coughs> archaeology, there's a architecture, there's a, a history, and uh, I was rather sad to lose that sort of history. It's like as we talk about connectivity in the uh, Paxton area where you have the possibility of a, a trace from Kankakee to Rantoul so that you can look at Prairie. We lose uh, a, a historic high school. Uh, so it depends a lot on, <coughs> on the location. If you're at <coughs> Wobbler Woods and you're near to a uh, university town, you're likely to have more uh, involvement in preservation. Not always so, but <coughs> at, uh, there's also the groups of people who get involved in this sort of question uh, n need to uh, educate broadly. And that's part of what we're doing with this program is to to provide people with information so that they can enjoy bringing together uh, these plots of land or these uh, sociological interests, uh, the development of churches, the uh, development of city squares. The uh, Many of these buildings are older and they are not uh, easy to use. Uh, for instance, if <coughs> you, <coughs> excuse me, you have a, a three-story school that doesn't have an elevator, then you may have to cut uh, disabled people uh, up to a f f third floor. So schools that are one and two stories high and flat are more popular. Uh, but then what do you do with the, the school? So at the moment, Monticello is working on a high school uh, expansion and restoration. And there's been a lot of debate about what should happen to the schools. In one case, the school is taken down because the space was needed for a more modern facility. Uh, and, uh, it takes a little get up and go to do this because at the initial stages it's not going to be an economically uh, rewarding thing and and if you're not very careful of the school or the Pepsin factory or uh, the railroad station can sit unoccupied and uh, be a target for uh, 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 vandalism and so it's often much easier to remove the school so that there's no problem. Uh, at Paxton, we had uh, a, a Royer designed high school which had uh, at least regional and state and perhaps even uh, national status. So uh, we've lost, lost that icon. <clears throat> we also lost the Pepsin factory, and it's been very hard to get any agency to, to replace that factory or the area where it, it had its footprints. Uh, so as we go, uh, some of us are, uh, can be regarded as t uh, tilting at windmills, uh, and uh, we don't always win, but uh, overall, you, you look at this sort of connectivity between uh, various uh, 
items that come together. Uh, and uh, usually there are small teams. It's uh, uh, maybe six, eight or ten people with a membership that might be la larger uh, that work on this. And in the long run, these sites become tourist att attractions. Uh, people have more time. They're having fewer children and they uh, are living longer because medicine has enabled that. And, and uh, these people are, are very curious about what other communities do, whether you have a Scandinavian or an Irish or a German community, uh, what are the characteristics. So uh, tourism becomes a potential uh, income for these communities, but it takes, it may take a hundred years to develop those sorts of resources and museums. Museums have a rough time because they uh, don't always know what to preserve. Uh, they have more materials than they can uh, deal with and there's not very much money for such uh, establishments. But every once in a while these things take off. The Monticello Railroad Museum used to be in Champaign, migrated to uh, an interurban at Monticello, and then uh, has gradually evolved into a national level railroad museum. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's taken place in a matter of 50 years. Uh, so you have to give credit to those people who have worked those sorts of situations and, and made them uh, work. You have to bring together people who are very different as uh, the person who might want to save the uh, high school may be very different from the engineer that wants to, to uh, uh, eliminate this ugly building which may be a, a historic monster. So. How do you uh, work with the community? It's very easy to be negative and say, that Pepsin factory is, is looking cr cruddy. Uh, we don't have the money to do anything with it. Let's get rid of it. If you were in Europe, you're sometimes living in, uh, visiting in buildings that are uh, a thousand years old. Uh, but here we seem to have... Uh, a, 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 a tendency to mow it or destroy it or uh, not allow it to exist in its dignity. If you were in England or Scotland, you would have castles. And do they take the castles down? No. You could go to Colchester or wherever and there's a castle or an abbey or... Uh, something and it may be in ruins but it, it's 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 there and if you go to Europe it's the same sort of thing so oh we're coming to it to the, to the end uh, but I encourage you to look at the connectivity of uh, Shady Rest and its area around it and Monticello and uh, uh, lots of luck uh, looking at these areas visit them and find out where they are this is Dave Monk, your Prairie Monk, WEFT Champagne, 90.1 on your FM dial. And Dave on the board, and as always, the views and opinions expressed are solely those of the speakers and no one else.